Thank you, Amy, first of all, for this really, really wonderful and generous introduction. I feel very privileged and I feel very happy to be able to address this group of people together. And two prominent sentiments are in my heart as I address you. One is I feel at home, and second, I feel deep gratitude. Why do I feel at home? Well, Amy, so as I said, finally and generously introduced, introduced me, also my wife, about our time in Oxford some 13 years ago when we arrived here. And uh, I did my doctorate, she did her master's in uh, international publishing. And at the same time, we have encountered this wonderful ministry, as that I am, here in Oxford. We were basically at that time sharing some facilities at the beginning. And uh, the second thing why I feel at home is that this church was actually the place where we worshipped. So I can just imagine our, at that time, now 20 years old daughter, at that time at a precious and fragile age of seven, saying to us, Mom and Dad, this is going to be our church. And I can remember her standing here just before the children's church began, singing and dancing. And the overall verdict on this experience of four years, by the time we returned back to Macedonia, was mom and dad in this church, in this context, they taught me how to love God. For that, I'm enormously grateful. So I feel at home, so relax, I'm not nervous. And the second thing, I know this looks like I'm going to sing, and all of those who know my register of voice are very, very grateful I will not sing. I will just speak. And the second thing is, what a privilege, what a gratitude to be a member of this ministry, of this family, and of this community. Nothing would be possible for us, humanly speaking, if it wasn't for this wonderful support we receive most immediately from people like Amy and Michael and other people, Ian Smith, I must mention, and also by many of you here who trust us, love us, and encourage us. So, human or divine, Let's think and delve into the beginning of the Christological question. In his introduction of his book, How on Earth Did Jesus Became a God? Larry Hurtado argues persuasively that our earliest Christian writings from approximately 50 to 60 AD already presuppose cultic devotion to Jesus as a familiar and defining feature of Christian circles wherever they were found. And if you were wondering what exactly he's trying to say, he's basically referring to the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and 3. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who are in every place, all upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And my favorite, Philippians 2, 5 to 6. Have the same attitude of mind Christ Jesus had, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. So it's from the very, very early beginnings of the early contemplations and thinking of how the church should imagine itself, they have already developed a reflection of Jesus Christ, of someone who they need to worship. And they needed actually to bring together those two ideals of monotheism, of which Amy, speaking on the Trinity yesterday, so superbly explained to us. And at the same time, to understand how this man, how this Jesus, were at the same time worthy of all worship. So the early church did a very, very serious theological thought 
how to might speak about Jesus at some transcendent level to account for his elevated place in its faith and spirituality. So this is apparent, for instance, in the claims made for the Galilean carpenter's son in the prologue of John's gospel. Very famous verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that was made, and in Him was life. And that life was the light of man. Darkness does not have the final word. The word, the light, has the final word. Pun intended, although I know English is not my first language, maybe it wasn't a pun. The word became flesh and lived for a while among us. A beautiful illustration John has. It's actually, he says, he pitched his tent among us. And it also reminds us of the tabernacle, which was actually a glorified tent. The presence of the Lord with us. He has planted, he pitched his tent among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and the only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. So the church needed to think, needed to reckon with these particular verses. Actually, if we go back to Philippians 2, 5, not only uh, uh, 6, but 5 to 11. And if you read that in the, in the original language, you will see it rhymes. It's actually some sort of a hymn. And what do we believe is perhaps that Paul, as much as we like Paul, as much as we adore his literary prose, did borrow this from the early church. He included this into his writing. And this is already a signal, a sign, what the church took as something very inherent to its own entity and self-understanding. And the Christological problem, really, in the first three centuries was this particular fight. How are we going to understand who Jesus is as our God and Lord, and at the same time, our brother, the same, of the same flesh, the one who was crucified, incarnated, crucified, dead, and eventually resurrected for us. One of the greatest, greatest, and my favorite 20th century uh, century theologians and historians was Yaroslav Pelikan. And in one of his five very significant volumes on the history of doctrine, he would say, amid all the varieties of response to the agnostic systems, Christians were sure that the Redeemer did not belong to some lower order of divine reality, but was God himself. And now, I love this. The oldest sermon of the Christian church after the New Testament, which is a late contemporary to some of the latest writings of the New Testament, is a sermon that begins with the following words. Just listen to this. It is supposedly written by Clement of Rome, but it's even better. We don't know who wrote it. Now we are absolutely sure it doesn't come from the time of Clement. It comes a bit earlier. Perhaps written even in 95 AD. Perhaps almost a contemporary of John the Evangelist. Brethren, we ought so to think of Jesus Christ as of God, as of the judge of living and death, and we ought not to belittle our salvation. For when we belittle him, we accept to receive little. So the early church knew very, very early, it is not about us. It's not about humanity. But at the same time, when we look at the human and divine Jesus Christ, we want much. We want all. So what was the Christological then problem? What was the tension that was rising from this particular understanding of Jesus Christ? Number one was the proclamation of Jesus as universal savior, logos theology. And this is precisely what Paul does when he goes in Athens in Acts chapter 17 and onwards from verse 16 onwards. He is so so dismayed and disappointed by the idolatry. And then he introduces to them this logos, this savior. And he says to the people at the Areopagus, 
all of your divinities, basically. Although he is using a very, very smart way of approaching them, he is disarming them, and then he is giving them a sucker punch. Because the word he uses about pious, 50% in the literature can mean pious, but the other 50% means superstitious. Guess what Paul meant with that word? And then he says, none of these gods are alive. It is this Logos. It is this Jesus Christ who has been resurrected from the dead. And the reality of the incarnation had to be emphasized to refuse docetists. What was docetism? Docetism was a very early, let's call it heresy, which was basically trying to say that Jesus was not fully human. He just appeared to look like a human. And that's where it comes from. It comes from the word dokeo, which means it seems. It just appears that he looks like that. But the early church responded vehemently against that. Even the, first, the, uh, the New Testament documents, the, the, jo- the Johannine literature, like the first and second John, etc., they're actually addressing this issue, saying that Jesus has come into this world into flesh. But not only that, Ignatius, a bishop of Antioch, one of the earliest and, and the bravest of all of martyrs we can record in the, in the early second century, When in the early 2nd century, as he journeyed to to his execution to Rome, he writes the following thing. Stop your ears. Therefore, when anyone speaks to you at variance of Jesus Christ, who was descended from David, was also of Mary, who was truly born, truly means in, in flesh, and did eat and drink, he was truly persecuted, under Pontius Pilate, he was truly crucified, truly died, and he was truly raised from the dead. So Jesus was not some sort of a apparition. He was not some sort of a ghost. But Jesus actually came to be completely one of us. And in a very influential book written in the second half of the, of the second century, D.M. Bailey, God was in Christ, an essay on incarnation and atonement, spoke of the church from the Council of Constantinople to modern times in this way. He says, the church has always had to fight docetism. The idea that we believe in Jesus Christ, who is divine, and it's easy to relate to this divinity, but then it's very difficult for us to relate to his humanity. But the church got it right. It says, no, Jesus Christ was a full man. Completely man. And this is the question. Human and divine. Human or divine. And you'll see as this talk unfolds. On the opposite side of the heresies, so one is docetism. The other one is called ebionitism. So the ebionites were a community of Jewish Christians who actually fled from Jerusalem Jerusalem at the outbreak of Jewish war around AD 66 and moved to Pella in the Transjordan where they were isolated from the wider church and eventually disappeared from history, but they have left some of their imprint on the early church. Of their own literature is very little, very, very little has remained. All that we have are some excerpts from other writers, as I'm going to quote one of them, Epiphanius of Salamis, in his Panarion. This is what he says. There is one physician, and of of this account, that say that Jesus was begotten of the seed of man and was chosen, and so by the choice of God he was called the Son of God from the Christ that came into him from above in the likeness of a dove. So what was ebionitism? Basically what they really believed, if Epiphanius is to be believed as he is actually describing them in his assessment, the Ebionites actually held that what can be described as some sort of adoptionist form of Christology. An adoptionist form of Christology basically was that there was a man, individual, personal Jesus, who grew up independently of the Logos, and at a certain point, he was basically inhabited by that Logos. So that is adoptionism uh, uh, theology. Basically, a man that is promoted somehow to some sort of a, div- div- uh, a level of some sort of divinity. 
So the early church realized none of this would do. We believe in Jesus Christ, we worship him, we love him, and we adore him. And at the same time, we know he is our brother. He is of the same flesh. He was born of the Virgin Mary. And that's why very early in the second half of the second century, a so-called theology of distinction is already being developed. A theology of distinction is that we ought to understand Jesus Christ as basically both. And so in his letter to the Ephesians, written early in the second century, Ignatius also writes the following thing. There is one physician who is possessed both of flesh and spirit, both made and not made, God existing in flesh, through life in that, both of Mary and of God, first passable and then impassable, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then a bit later in the same century, towards the end of that century, a very, very towering figure shows up in the theological field, and his name is Irenaeus of Lyon. He was a disciple of Justin, of Justin, uh, of, uh, of uh, I forgot his name now, of Smyrna, Polycarp of Smyrna. He was a disciple, and then he moved to, to what is today's France. And then we have one excerpt from his a, a bit longer, and I'm putting it here so that it, you will feel the whole array of all thinking and belief that people had about Jesus Christ. And to, to be honest with you, as a theologian who has read kind of widely on this, in this field, I think very often I find that even within the church sometimes or the wider context of, of the so-called Christendom, we actually encounter these beliefs. And this is what Irenaeus lists in his work, very influential work, against heresies. For there we have it, that the Word and Christ never came into this world, that the Savior too never became incarnate nor suffered, but that he descended like a dove upon the dispensation of Jesus, and that as soon as he had declared the unknown Father, he did again ascend into the pleroma, into the fullness of heaven, that is. Some, however, make the assertion that this dispensational Jesus did become incarnate and suffered, whom they represent as having passed through Mary just as a water through a tube. But others allege him to be the son of the Demiurge, that is a half-god, approximately the creator god, upon whom the dispensational Jesus descended, while others, again, say that Jesus was born from Joseph and Mary, and that the Christ from above descended upon him, being without flesh and impassable. But according to the opinion of none of the heretics was the word of God made flesh. So aware of this far-reaching significance of the point that the issue Irenaeus argues repeatedly that Jesus Christ is one person. He cannot be split, neither he can be mixed or mingled. And that's why, actually, we have a big, big controversy about which specifically Amy spoke yesterday. The controversy about the Trinity, which began with the question of Christ's or Jesus' divinity. Who was he? There was one movement within the church from around Alexandria, revolving around a man called Arius. And Arius was trying to resolve this particular problem of how we can also worship God and Jesus Christ at the same time acknowledge him as a man. And he tried to resolve this problem in the following way. If he was trying to say that basically Jesus Christ was divine. Even they used, the Arians used a very strong word called, he was a strong God. But God in the level of being promoted to divinity. No, he was the first creation that God created. And through that particular special creation, God created everything else. But there was the champion of orthodoxy of the Catholic Church, which means of the true faith and the universal church called Athanasius of Alexandria. If we reduce all his work into one single line, is this is it uh, against the Arians, this is what uh, it will look like. No matter how the Arians huff and puff, what they preach is a creature promoted to the status of God, and they cannot help it. And at the same time, uh, 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 Athanasius says, but we need to approach this God because he has actually taken flesh upon himself. And if a true God does not take a true flesh upon himself, 
How is it possible that God has become man, in, uh, human, in order that the humanity can participate in the divine? So that was the main question. So you see how this actually affects not only some kind of intellectual levels in our mind, some theory, but it's a very practical thing. It is the question, it is at stake. Our salvation is at stake. Who was the one who was born of Mary? Who was the one who was walking the, 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 the land of, 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 of Judea? Who was the one walking on the Sea of Galilee? And according to Athanasius, that was God himself. You see, actually Christians were, were very, very crucial about introducing a very significant uh, philosophical category to the Greek category of being. They also introduced the category of will. Because according to the Aryans, the whole idea about God willing something was actually that God willed the creation of Jesus Christ. Therefore, because he is just willed, if he is a father and gives, uh, generates the son by his will, by that, that definition, Jesus is immediately lesser ontological than God as creator. And then Athanasius says wisely, there is a level of order of being, which is on the level of essence, and there is order of God's will. So God generates everything by his essence. So when he eternally generates the son through him, the father and the son, this is the equal comes out of him eternally. And that the Holy Spirit later, we, we found out, proceeds from the Father also eternally. But when God decides, he actually creates by his will. And this is ex nihilo. This is creation which God wills and is categorically and ontologically different from the creator. God is distinct from God. Uh, Christ is distinct from God the Father, and yet he's sharing his essence. Well, the Nicene Creed, the one we read yesterday, has actually brought us to a certain extent of understanding of Jesus Christ, but still did not quite grasp the complexity of the personality of Jesus Christ. And how is it, was it possible for us to believe that he was both human and divine at the same time? And especially this particular problem develops from the 360s onwards. I will not bother you, not only with homoousius, that's only one word, but there are so many homoio things there that is getting really mind-boggling. Some of them were homoians. Christ just was like God. Some of them were homoiousios, which means God, the, Jesus Christ was just a bit like the essence of God, but not quite, etc., etc. And as I said, no matter what they did, eventually they reduced Jesus Christ to the level of creation. On the other side, what is the other? All the time you will see that the temptation about thinking about Jesus heretically would be go into the docetic side, he was not really true human, truly human, and going on the other side and to say he was not truly divine. And one such man who was actually a big champion of, of, of Nicaea and of the homoousius, the idea that Christ is of the same essence with the Father, was somehow called Apollinarius of Laodicea. And Apollinarius of Laodicea was trying basically to again square this confusion around Jesus Christ and how we can understand him. He was a very good friend of Athanasius and he shared his theological perspective. He was deeply committed to safeguarding the doctrine of the son's substantial or, or uh, natural unity with the father embodied in the Nicene Creed. His conclusion is logical outcome of the use of the word flash model for Christ's person, versus something what later the Antiochians developed of a word man, understanding of who Christ was. So he is using Trinitarian language to explain this Christological mystery, and he spoke of one hypostasis, that's one person of the Son, the Logos, which according to him took the place of Jesus' mind or soul, but more likely mind. And again, what do we have here? A very neat and nice solution. A solution. We have just resolved it. So yes, Jesus had a full, ma a full body, everything, but when it came to the mind, it was actually the Logos controlling everything. All resolved. <laughs> but knowing that Gnosticism has always been a problem to the church in the first couple of centuries, Tertullian and Athanasius and Origen have spoken against these Gnostics, and they have kept saying that Christ has come into full flesh. And they have used one 
saying. And the saying was, what is not assumed, it is not healed. And one great thinker and theologian called Gregory of Nazianzus, the bishop of Nazianzus in the fourth century, one of the great Cappadocian fathers, I love them, <laughs> comes and says the same thing. What is not assumed, it is not healed. If Christ has not taken upon himself human mind, he would not have healed my mind. Very often I think that is true because my mind has not been healed really. But no. Jesus has to be 100% equal like us. On the same level. And then we have a long term quarrel between two schools of thought. One is Antiochia and the other one is Alexandria. To really bring a very long story short and complex, I would say this. Alexandrians, the temptation is docketism. Christ was not quite human. Antiochians, the problem is actually something which I didn't mention yet, but I will, called Nestorianism. Basically, Jesus was not really one person, but two persons kind of stapled together. So these are the two directions where this particular problem could go. But both of them are important. Why? Because they are both emphasizing something incredibly important, not incredibly, but essentially important about Christianity. And there were between then, in this particular, between 431, when one kind of a, of a, of a ecumenical council happened in Ephesus where they discussed this problem, and they decidedly agreed that Christ cannot be two different persons, this dialogue developed between 431 to 451 until we come to the fourth ecumenical council called, called the Council of Chalcedon. So we had also, just immediately before that, we had two rival councils. The one council in Ephesus, led by Cyril of Alexandria, condemned Nestorius' Christological uh, ideas that Christ is actually almost two persons, and therefore, for that reason, Nestorius thought that we cannot call Mary Theotokos, which in translation means not really the mother of God, but means the God-bearer, the one who gave birth to divinity. And a rival council, which was called a robber council later, was led by John of Antioch, and there was drafted a diaphysic formula proposed by Theodoret of Cyrus, a rival of Cyril of Alexandria. Eventually, we come to the Chalcedon Council. And what was the foundation? The foundation of this council was actually the Alexandrian emphasis on the unity and integrity of Christ. The one who was truly God and truly man, whose two natures were united in one hypostasis, in one person. But it was also able to affirm clearly and unambiguously the Antiochian insight that Christ's divine and human nature each had their own integrity, authenticity, and freedom of operation. So what has really the Council of Chalcedon achieved in part one? Jesus is perfect in humanity and perfect in divinity through God and through man. And in part two, Jesus is to be confessed in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, and without separation. The famous four adjectives of the statement of Chalcedon. So the difference of the two natures is not canceled by the fact that they are united. We must acknowledge the individual features of each of the two natures, even though they come together in one person or one hypostasis. So the definition closes with the statement that the council acknowledges and affirms all the faith that has been established by Nicaea, the first Constantin uh, uh, council of Constant uh, Constantinople in 381, and uh, the, 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 the council in Ephesus in 431. So what was the significance of Chalcedon, really? That finally we have one Christ, and he is a true God and true man. So the Chalcedonian compromise between Alexandria and Antioch finally led to an acknowledgement of the core of the truth in, in, in all other statements. What was the Alexandrian addition in this context? The Son of God made himself present in the life of Jesus. Therefore, God saved us. This is very important. If Jesus was not divine, he could not have saved us. And there is also another 
uh, kind of a, uh, a dictum, very for, uh, important theological dictum. Who can save us only? This is not a trick question. It's very easy. I who can save us only? Jesus, God. And who has to pay the sin? Man. And therefore, God becomes man. The one who can, who can joins to the one who must. You see, Jesus Christ was not walking around. As I said, that would be adoptionism. Jesus was not walking around one day nearby uh, the river Jordan and suddenly jo uh, uh, the Baptist sees him, brings him into the river, and he says, bang, from now on, you're kind of half God, half human. No, that wasn't the case. What is very important is that Jesus takes, or the divinity logos, takes the generic human nature upon himself. By this, he actually takes every one of us. Wow! It's not only Jesus, the Palestinian son of Mary. In all right, it is actually you. Amy, you're the closest one here. Amy, it is you. He took upon himself you in order to save us and heal us. That's the only way how he could have done it. But at the same time, he's actually man. He thirsted. He suffered. He cried. He was absolutely part of us. And therefore, we need to acknowledge him as our Lord, as our divine second person of the Trinity, the Logos and the Son of God, and our brother in flesh. So what has the Chalcedonian formula said? They say, following then the Holy Fathers, we all with one accord teach that it should be confessed that Jesus Christ is one and the same Son. And then I'll just skip. It's a long quote, so we'll go that he said, but on the last days for us and for our salvation of Mary, the virgin Theotokos, as to his humanity, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, recognized in two natures without confusion, without change, without division, and without separation. The difference in natures being in no way removed by the union, rather the distinctive character of each nature being preserved. So what do we believe? We believe in one hypostasis, Jesus Christ, who is in two natures, both divine and human, not mingled, not mixed. We don't believe in, 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 in uh, Heracles. What is the English word? Uh, Hercules. We don't believe in Hercules. Some sort of a Zeus tricking a human and then something in between a third Sub, can, uh, 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 third nature uh, uh, essence uh, is, is being born. No. And again, in this particular kind of very turmoil time between the 5th and the 7th century, two prominent kind of thinking about Jesus were, were rival to what we know as a mainstream uh, Orthodox Catholic Christianity. The one is called, mono, it's more famous as a, uh, more known as a monophysitism, but really the proper word should be miaphysitism, one nature. And the other one, a bit later, I will call it, it's called monoenergism or monotheletism. I will explain both. So what is monophysitism? Basically, monophysitism, it, it, is, it, is, it is the logical development of what Apollinarius taught. So yes, Christ is of two natures. Oh, if you read all the long pages about the quarrels, that Christ is from two natures, but whether he is in one or two natures, that is the question, and I'm not Shakespeare. So... In this context, in this particular context, the problem is, how can we think about Jesus? And because we cannot think about Jesus as a fully human, what do we do is we resolve it by, yes, Christ has taken upon himself human nature, but the divine nature is so vastly and infinitely larger, bigger, whatever, pick up your word, so that basically the human just dissolves as a molecule of water in a huge ocean. Wow. Hmm. I repeat this. No, I can't. So, this is where we are. This is where the rubber meets the road. If it's an English or American saying, I don't know. I learn it. 
both ways. And the, and the Orthodox and Catholic Christianity and the mainstream Christianity, the Reformation Christianity has always said, no, 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 we cannot just resolve this by neatly putting it into, into some category. We have to keep the mystery there. So that a couple of centuries later, we come to the, something which was called monoenergism and monotheletism. And here comes a hero of mine. His name is Maximus da Confessor. I have spent four years reading him. Actually, I've spent more of my time reading dead people. <laughs> but their words come so much alive when you read them. So Maximus the Confessor was one of those heroes. Why is he called the Confessor? Because his right hand was cut off and his tongue was plucked because he was preaching what we, now to, we know today that Christ did not have only two natures, but he also had two energies and two wills. In order to bring a reproachment between the Diophysites, which were the Orthodox and the Catholics, and the Miaphysites, the Emperor Heraclit, Heraclius in, in, um, uh, six, uh, six, uh, in the beginning of the 7th century, and the Patriarch Sergius decided to bring them into the, into the communion, and they invented this idea of monoenergism and monotheletism. And then Maximus just came up and he said, no, if we want to follow the logic of everything that has been said by the church fathers by now, a will pertains to nature. So Christ must have two energies and two wills. He must have divine nature and energy, uh, 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 divine uh, energy and divine will, and also the, uh, human uh, energy and human will. Otherwise, he says, how is it possible to think about Jesus in Gethsemane in Matthew 26, praying, not my will, but yours be done. Also, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Paul, in Philippians 5 to 11, we see that it's a divine condescension by the eternal Son coming among us. And third, it was the outworking of the free act of God, the Father's volition, as he demonstrated his love for the world. So monotelites have always been embarrassed by the expression, not my will, but yours. And Maximus the Confessor, whom I will mention a bit later again, was the big champion. He was actually the sole voice about what the church believes. And sometimes, I really, I want to, I, when I talk to people and I talk to, to, uh, to, some, to, to Christians and I ask them, so what do you believe about Jesus Christ? And they can master to say he was divine and human. They can come to the point of talking about two natures. But when I ask them, had he had one or two wills or one or two energies, they got stuck a little bit. <laughs> and so from now on, just to clarify that, if somebody asks you, Jesus had two energies and two wills, divine and human, in order to operate as divine and human and in one person. And then, who comes to the rescue? In the 16th century, until then, there was no big debate about Christology. But in the 16th century, as the Reformation was unfolding, we have one development which is called, or a movement, which was called Socinianism. The Socinians basically were the old Arians to a certain extent. And they have raised this particular issue about Christology again. And who came to the rescue to answer it? And I didn't have a preview peek into Amy's notes yesterday, John Owen, <laughs> the Puritan. So it was his awareness of the frailty of Jesus' humanity apart from the spirit and his emphasis on the divine forming that took place in Jesus' life through flesh, light on some otherwise difficult texts in Hebrews 2, 10 and 11 and in Hebrews 5, 7 to 9. So what Owen really did and he truly and uh, uh, kind of endowed us with a, with a good language to think about Jesus, was that he understood the incarnation to mean that the Son not only took upon himself a human nature, but also entered fully into the human condition as we now find it. So Owen was also a vigorous proponent of Alexandrian emphasis of Christ's unity. The Logos does not replace, according to Owen, the human mind in Jesus or overpower it's free action. Rather, he leads and guides it through the Spirit. In his humanity, Jesus is as we are. He knows and responds to God as we do, by the agency of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, what was the help of Chalcedon? He says, the definition of Chalcedon emphasized the incarnational idea that the divine and the creaturely realities are ontologically inseparable. 
on one the same Spirit, Son, Lord, only begotten, recognized in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, and without separation. So to speak of Jesus Christ in classical incarnational Christology is to speak of single substantial reality includes a human body and human mind. It's impossible not to think about human body and human mind. Well, I think we are out of the woods by now. Because finally we can ask another question, which comes, brings us a bit closer to home. Christ for us today. So who is this human and divine person? Who is this Jesus Christ for us today? The theologian, our own, of this place, of this city and this university, Johannes Zachuber, when he uh, speaks about this particular issue on Christology, especially modern Christology, he makes a very significant statement as far as I'm concerned. Because he says that, yes, we need to emulate Jesus Christ, we need to be like Jesus, we need to follow, we need to understand Christology also as ethics. But he says, many of these things actually do not work on the level of only example and on the level of, of rules, uh, rewards, and punishment. Because there is no guarantee we could actually follow them. So he asks the question, what is then the key to our understanding of Jesus Christ as ethics into our lives today. This is what Johannes the Kuber says. The believer must first believe he can be like Christ to imitate him effectively. In other words, come on, we cannot get away from C.S. Lewis. In other words, he's basically summarizing something that C.S. Lewis has been say, telling us a very long time. You become what you do. And this brings us to the early church fathers who were thinking about Jesus Christ, about human and divine, and they understood that as we begin our journey with God, it is not so much that we understand everything, we squared everything, but actually it is something on the level of what we saw, just of practice, as they called it. Practice. You do stuff, and then you become one. I am not a runner. Perhaps you can say that, you can tell that. It's, it's visible. And just imagine if somebody told me, tomorrow you're going to run a marathon. <laughs> no. But what if I said, I will just try every day. I'll do my 100 yards tomorrow morning as much as I can muster. And more and more onwards. So we need to believe. We need faith. And in Hebrews 11, as it says, it says, what is faith? Faith is like this certainty. And do you know the word, that, the Greek word that is used there for certainty about faith? It is hypostasis. The very same word we use about the humanity, about the personality of Jesus Christ. And it simply means that this is the ground on which we plant all our trust. If you came to an ancient Hebrew and asked him a question, what is the meaning of life? He would have said, what is that question? If it's, it's as if, it's if you ask him the question, do you believe in God? He would say, what is that question? The only question that was reasonable in the mind of the ancient Hebrew was, do you trust him? Do you trust him? So the question is, do we trust Jesus Christ? If we trust him, if we trust him, then we can trust that he can make us do what he does. In other words, the example, the imitator relation can only work on the foundation of another relation which enables the believer to follow that route successfully. And this other relation is the relation of faith. Faith meaning to have trust, confidence. Christians have confidence that encountering Jesus will transform them in a way that then enables them to follow his example. In Ephesians 2.10, God, uh, Paul calls us what? We are God's hand. Work, handwork, handwork, hand, hand, handy, handy work. I don't have it here, in, so I need. Do you know what is in, in the original language? It is based on the term poiesis, and it's literally called poema. So, what really Paul is saying there that we are God's poem. We rhyme, 
although we look, we are in total mess. With a little bit of Christ cosmetics, of what John mentioned, we become to rhyme and we become beautiful. We become Christ-like. So we can conclude that faith is a certain poiesis. Its poetics is the language of the church, its sacramental structure, which every believer realizes in their own original way and according to the inspiration of the living spirit. In that sense, the believer is an artist. I love that. You, we all are artists whose medium is their own life received as a gift. In other words, our life is God's gift that we have been endowed with and as an expression of gratitude and worship, we create our own personal poem. That is why Christ has become man. That is why. So that every one of us will be the best poem ever. An eternal poem. A beautiful song. One day even I can sing in heaven. Another hero of mine from the 20th century, his name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He had a specific Christology. But the most important aspect of that, of Christ for us today, was basically he said, I'm not using God as Deus ex machina. Which basically means, I'm in big troubles, there is a red button, alert, push it, and God reacts. This is exactly what happened in the ancient Hellenic drama. There was a contraption, and when they needed someone to act, they would put this contraption, and Zeus or whoever would come out from the machine and the above and resolve the problem. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, no, this is all wrong. We are not to look into God as a deus ex machina with no relationship with him. But what he does, he says, God lets himself be pushed out of the world onto the cross. He is weak and powerless in the world. And this is precisely the way, the only way in which he is with us and helps us. The main question, according to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, is not how we're going to extricate ourselves from the problems of our current life, but how is going the next generation to live? That is the main question. And this is exactly why Jesus became man, to see how the next generation of humanity is going to live. And in cost of discipleship, it is crucial, he argues, that the following Jesus is first of all answering a call of authority, not good feeling. Follow after me. He's not telling them why this would be a good idea, nor they are asking him why they ought to do this. Following Jesus is something that goes in principle against the nature and the inclinations of a sinful humanity. And Bohofer has shown us splendidly, displayed it in a wonderful way. My hero, Maximus the Confessor, in one of his ascetical writings in Liber Asceticus number 15, makes a strong confirmation of the ideal of Jesus Christ's love, both divine and human, is that renunciation, giving up of all satanic scheming and reasoning, victory is to be won not through power, not through flexing muscles, not through missiles, but by giving up. By giving up, he says, Christ and the apostles conquered who taught to conquer. Vincent van Gogh, wow. You think, what? Where he is coming from? <laughs> well, before he was an artist for 10 years, he was a pastor in the Reformed Church. He loved Jesus Christ. It's a long story why he ended where he ended. But there is a beautiful quotation by him I want to share with you. There is something noble, something great, which cannot be destined to the worms. This is far. This is... Uh, uh, which cannot be destined to the, the worm. This is far from all theology. Simply the act that the poorest little woodcutter or a peasant on the heart of or a miner can have moments of emotion and inspiration that gave him a feeling of an eternal home. So, the unthinkable has happened. God, the absolute being, the self-sufficient creator to whom all creatures owe their existence, is willing <clears throat> to value humanity. And in the whole world, as something worthy of sacrifice, the believer's love is proven through only if it pierces through the boundaries of self-love and in sacrifice. And Karl Barth, in his writing on Christology, would say, man is not good. 
That is indeed true and must once more be asserted. However, it must be the no which Jesus Christ has taken upon himself for us men in order that it may no longer affect us and that we may no longer place ourselves under it. What takes place in God's humanity is since it includes that no in itself, the affirmation of man. Well done, Karl Barth. Good statement. I love it. Why? Because John Lennox was telling us this morning about Jesus walking on the water. And this was one of the signs. I also have another wonderful image I have from uh, from Mark chapter 6, where also Jesus is doing the same thing. He's walking on water. But do you know what happens there? The text says, it looked as if he wanted to bypass them. And we don't know what to do with this text, do we? But if we go to Exodus 14 and read onwards, we will understand that, especially the Greek word that is a translation of the Septuagint in the Old Testament, the very same word, parerchomai, the same word about passing by that is used about Jesus passing by the disciples is the same word that is applicable to Yahweh passing by, showing his glory to Moses and telling him, I am. The same Jesus Christ comes to them, comes the water, And he tells them, I am. In brief, Exodus 14, we are given the broad narrative and contextual furniture that renders Mark 6 as an Exodus account. In Exodus 33 to 34, we see that pregnant revelatory significance of Jesus passing by the disciples. From Job 9, we learn that when Jesus walks on the waves of the shore, stormy sea, he is doing what is done only by the transcendent creator, God, who has become man. Why? If I can have the final slide, you can be relieved. We have come to the final slide. Why? This is a painting. It's called the Pieta by Vincent van Gogh. It's Mary mourning over the broken, pierced, dead body of her beloved son. But if you can look closer, if you can look at the face, What are you going to see? It is not anybody's face, but it's actually the face of Vincent van Gogh. He got it. He was as good a theologian as he was a painter. (laughs) Not understood in his own time, but brilliant. Why? Because he knew that this body took upon himself this generic human nature, and one of these incorporated people was Vincent van Gogh himself. We can put, every one of us, we can put that face, our face, there with all the right, not by, uh, not by right, sorry, but by faith. We have the right to do this because we have faith in Jesus Christ. We enter, and we know that this broken body, that we know that this helpless, dead flesh was at the same time the infinite, powerful, omnipotent, omniscient God, the creator. And you know what? He loves us. He did the most heroic thing. Not that he died on the cross, the most heroic thing is that he become one of us. Amen.